Hello everyone, welcome back to Baller. This is brought to you by Who Scored in association with Labbrook's Five Aside. Today we're going to be talking about the FA Cup semi-final between Chelsea and Crystal Palace. A little bit later on as well, we're going to look at some insights, how to give you some value, maybe talk about what went wrong for us last week in our Five Aside, but we're also going to pick our Five Aside and I want to know how your Five Asides got on last week as well. But we are talking about Crystal Palace and Chelsea and Raj, I want to know, why is Vieira doing such a good job at Crystal Palace? Yeah, so as you say, Vieira, it's been really impressive how he's taken on this Palace job. And I think the most impressive thing about it is how he's transformed Palace's style of play. Under Hodgson, for years, really, they had an ingrained style of play, which is more defensive and more on the back foot, really, and looking to stop other teams rather than implementing their own style of play on on, on others. Um, Vieira, recently, those results against Arsenal and Man City are probably what impressed me most as well. Two top sides, and he managed to get results against both of them. Um, I think we're so used to seeing mid to lower t- league table sides um, sit back against teams like that. But Vieira was able to implement his own brand of football on them. And, that, and that, that's really a great achievement from him. Do we think they're going to miss having Conor Gallagher available? I think he's been an absolute revelation. Probably one of my favourite players to watch in the Premier League this season. Um, is he going to be a massive miss? Yeah, I think so. He's been really the heartbeat of Vieira's transformation. I think most importantly, what we've been able to do is, with Gallagher in the side, he's been able to implement a higher press at times. I think organi- they've got good organised 4-5-1 kind of block where when teams are attacking them. But when teams have the ball around the back... Vieira then pushes that up into a kind of a 4-4-2 press with Gallagher then joining the striker in a front two to press the opposition centre-backs. And it's Gallagher's energy and ability to sense when to do that has been really valuable for Vieira. So, yeah, I agree with you. It's a massive miss against a team like Chelsea. I think as well with Gallagher, sometimes when loan players go from these big clubs to to lesser teams, I always wonder how the dynamic works there because I imagine that Player, maybe not Gallagher, but I imagine players that come from these big teams are on huge wages and, and must be one of like the top earners at one of these new sides. Um, and I always wondered, do, do they sort of walk in and think they're a bit of the dogs, you know, and and do they do they take liberties? But Gallagher just isn't that at all. He's, I think, first and foremost, his energy is just so infectious when you see him play. He he obviously contributes um, in, the, in the attacking third with those late runs into the box, but he also just really get stuck in. I think he's got eight yellow cards this season. He's always flying into tackles. And I think the Palace fans love that. And, and on a, based on who scored ratings this season, Conor Gallagher is actually one of the top rated new signings based over the whole season. And I think he's obviously well worth the England call up that he got earlier this, this year. Mason Mount likely be um, the star of the show or at least one of the stars of the show this weekend. Does Mason Mount's presence at Chelsea affect what Conor could do next season on his return? Yeah, possibly so, possibly so. I think it is a bit of a tough question to answer at the moment because I think there's a lot of tactical kind of uncertainty with Tuchel. He's using various different systems. Obviously, he's enjoyed using that free at the back system. I think if he does stick with the 3-4-3, it probably does limit Gallagher's minutes. Mount has one of the spots in the front three. I don't really think Gallagher is a player who probably suits playing in a midfield two in a in a pivot i think as as josh said his energy is brilliant his pressing is phenomenal his defensive work's good i think there are a few concerns over maybe his technical ability to be kind of like a high volume passer in midfield like a Jorginho, kante or kovacic um so if, if tuchel sticks with that then maybe there's no place for him but there, he has shown adaptations as well against real madrid he played loftus cheek in a kind of interesting role Loftus was a wing back sometimes off the ball, but on the ball he got higher up the pitch as kind of like a right winger, uh, and it was more like of a four four two system. So maybe Gallagher could suit that kind of role, where where his energy then becomes very valuable. Um, so yeah, but I think it is a tough question to answer at the moment. Yeah, it's it's difficult, isn't it? Because Mason Mount is undoubtedly this this one of the stars of of Chelsea's future. To be honest, I think if you look at him and Reese James, Reese James, they've got players for the next ten years or so. And I, when, when we came into this game, and uh, Martin and I were looking at sort of what sort of talking points uh, we could go through. Mason Mount propped up and we, well, I personally thought that he had had a bit of an underwhelming season, bit good in parts, patchy in others. And I looked at his output and he has 18 goals and assists in 21 league starts this season. That puts him fourth in the Premier League uh, behind Salah, Son and Kane. He's got more than Hotter, more than Mane, who when you think what sort of title challenge Liverpool are putting together, which really surprised me. He's got 14 assists in all competitions. He he is probably going to come into our five-a-side team, as we'll go through later on in the show. Um, that's more than second and third for Chelsea combined. So he has really uh, turned a page. And I think 
that has happened most since the turn of the year. With Mount, he's probably not a master of one particular thing. He's just very, very good at a lot of things. He's he's a decent passer. He's a decent dribbler. Uh, makes good runs into the box like that goal against Real Madrid, and he, and he can shoot as well. So that that's probably why he might fly under the radar a bit. From one player that's going to be in our five side team to another player that's in our five side team, Mike Gay. He's had a very impressive season under um, Patrick Vieira. How important is he going to be in this game this weekend? And what do you think has led to his success this season? As Raj said that Patrick Vieira has been able to implement this higher pressing style of play. And I think Mark Gahey is really important to that. Because I think him and alongside Joachim Anderson, I think they give Palace a real composure at the back. Almost like an insurance policy that if they do lose the ball, they've got two centre-backs that are more than capable of of keeping possession and winning it back. And they 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 don't really seem flustered. Uh, I think with those two at the back, that really helps them further forward up the pitch. And I think he, at, he's only 21. It's his first season at Palace and he's already captained them a few times recently, which just shows the strides that he's made in the presence that he has on the team. He's obviously been capped by England. The Ivory Coast want him to, to represent him as well, represent them as well. Um, and we're just looking at in terms of passes, which is where he'll come into our five-a-side team. Outside of the top four, he's made more passes than anyone else in the Premier League this season. At the age of 21, in his first season in the Premier League, that's that's really impressive. I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah, it's, it's really impressive. It caught me by surprise. Obviously, now Chelsea could lose three centre-backs in the summer. Uh, I imagine they obviously don't regret letting go of him because at the time it was a very good price for a player that had never played in the Premier League. But... Obviously, he's he's showing and he's showing other clubs that there's definitely value in Chelsea's academy. As you say, with potential departures like Rudiger and Christensen in the summer, I think Guehi might have been an absolutely ideal fit, particularly on the left side of the back three. I see a lot of parallels with Rudiger. His ball playing ability, as Josh mentioned, he's got an aggressive style of defending, like Rudiger stepping out and confronting players. Um, so yeah, maybe that is some that is one that Chelsea may live to regret. I think Levi Colwell might fill that hole next season if Rudy Good does go, but we'll talk about that one as and when that comes to it. Um, Reese James, I think he had a sensational performance against Vinicius midweek. He's up against Will Saha this weekend, probably. Give us your thoughts on his performance and how you think it'll go down this weekend. Yeah, it was a really impressive performance. I think it started off a bit shaky for him. Vinicius beat him a couple of times, uh, as he can do to any player, really. But the, what shows the strength of character of Reese James is how he came back from that. He absolutely dominated him in the end. Uh, Vinicius tried to find a way around him uh, and he just couldn't. I think what impressed me most about Reese James' defending is his body angle. Um, when you see the likes of Trent and Cancelo, they sometimes get beaten because they get caught too square on to their man. I think Salah did that to Cancelo a few times last week and Trent gets done the same. Uh, he just, they just get caught at that wrong angle. But James is brilliant at defending 1v1 and, and then his acceleration and his power just takes over in the end. And yeah, that is, it was a very impressive performance in midweek. To get booked in, in the opening 10 minutes and it, it was quite a bad booking as well. Like Vinicius Jr. had properly done him. Um, but then to come back from that, and he, he despite playing, obviously, the, the final 80 minutes with a yellow card, he completed eight tackles in that game, which is more than anyone else in the quarterfinal ties in midweek. Um, so, yeah, he, he's definitely going to be one for our five-a-side team in tackle, especially up against Zaha, who, who Steve, I know you're, you're not big on him, but he, he's going to try and bring something to Reese James. So there's definitely some tackles in there for him. Being politically correct, I'll call him predictable um, and say that I think he's probably going to run at him. He's not likely to be passing it round him, is he? He's going to run at him and I think that really plays into Reese James's hands for what we're going to put him in our five-a-side, which I think is two tackles, isn't it? It will be, yeah. It will be two yeah, tackles. I think he's got that all day long. I think that's going to be an absolute tap-in for him to bring. Uh, finally then, Werner and Havertz. Is it finally working? Yeah, I, I think there's a few positive signs in the last two games. I think the Southampton performance was a good start. And then against Real Madrid, they look lethal, really. I think what Tuchel's doing now, he's got Mount as a number 10 and floating behind that front two of Werner and Havertz. Um, I, I think what it really is, is it's suiting both of their playing styles. Werner's now just concentrating on making runs in that left-hand sided channel. Havertz is more of a fluid player. He'll rotate with mounts. He'll come to one side, come to the other side and link play. Um, but yeah, there's signs of that kind of system working now with with that setup. Um, I think what Havertz brings is he's got a language style, but he's constantly on the move. He makes those runs into the box. I think that's been a feature of Chelsea's play with Havertz finding space on, at the back of defenders, really. Um, and he also then moves to try and link play with the others, which someone like Lukaku doesn't do as well. So there are some positive signs, definitely. It's, it's, it's funny though, isn't it? Because I remember when Thomas Tuchel first came in to replace Lampard, everyone naturally assumed that Tuchel would get the best out of these big money signings like Havertz and Werner, basically because they're just all German. And obviously that wasn't the case. 
for a while. And, and they actually, they both started the Super Cup against Villarreal at the start of the season. Um, and then they only started one of the next 44 matches together, which is pretty oh. bizarre when you think how much they rotate up front for, for Chelsea. Yeah. Um, but now they've started uh, five. They've started five games together, and since the start of March, and I guess especially in the last two games in particular, you've seen the benefits there. Um, and Chelsea actually haven't lost. Chelsea have actually haven't lost twelve of the last thirteen that those two have started together. When you stretch back into to last season, so so maybe has it's taken him a while, but maybe Tuchel has stumbled across um, a workable system in attack. But I guess it just spells further bad news for Lukaku, really. So I did see an interesting quote from Tuchel earlier today, actually. It was in an interview with Glenn Hoddle. He said, he was asked, what type of player is Kai Havertz? He goes, I see a bit of Dennis Bergkamp, a bit of Robin Van Persie and a bit of Dimitar Berbatov. He can play in a kind of half nine position because he has good runs, but he's also free to move away from the nine position and create overloads to one side. So that kind of shows how fluid he is as a player, Kai Havertz. And that's why he might be able to bring the best out of the other players like Werner and Mount. Yeah, I think if you play in that position, though, you're doing it after have runners. You can't be the highest player on the pitch when you're doing that um, mm. frequently. Lukaku, what has gone wrong there? After his best season, I think, at Inter Milan last year, a massive money move back to Chelsea. Why has it not worked for him? I'm not going to lie. I sort of completely blanked out his last six months or so of last year at Manchester United and thought, OK, he's, he's gone away, he smashed that into, he'll come back and he'll do the business for Chelsea. But it just hasn't panned out that way at all. I think... Whenever you watch him, his debut, his date, well, his second debut back for Chelsea against Arsenal, I think it was. He looked unbelievable. He was yeah. dropping deep. He was pinning um, Arsenal defenders. He was spreading it out wide and then running into the box and dominating their defenders. But we've just not seen that at all since then. I think he just looks so disconnected from the rest of rest of the team. Which obviously, as Raj said, Havertz is so much more fluid in that respect. He drops deep and obviously he's bringing everyone else into play. Um, in a way that we probably thought Lukaku might, but yeah, it's just not worked. And a hundred million pounds on another striker that looks like it's going down the pan just it's not a great look for Chelsea and the other thing is as well Kai Havertz and Romelu Lukaku both like occupying that kind of inside right area and coming in on their left foot so I think it will be very very tricky to get them both in the same team now and it could spell the end for Lukaku at Chelsea in the summer no idea where he goes from that uh right Josh do you want to give us what our five-a-side team is for this weekend then please yeah, uh, before I do that, though, I'll just give a special shout out to the winner of our, our private league last last weekend. Obviously, there was a, a, over a thousand pounds in cash to be won, and the winner took the winner took home five hundred pounds. He had both Trent Alexander Arnold and Jao Cancelo to get assists in his team. Obviously, if you remember from last week, for all the listeners, we spoke about both of those players, but try to be too clever with Robertson. Um, he, he he did play the the switch switch pass for Trent Alexander Arnold's assist, obviously, but. It wasn't to be for us. And the winner's team was actually a 50 to 1 shout. So on top of winning £500, he obviously got whatever he staked on that 50 to 1 shout. But hopefully we'll, we'll better him this time. Um, as we've already alluded to in um, the show so far, for our cruncher, we've gone for Reese James to make two plus tackles. Obviously up against Will Saha, that'll be a very active battle. Uh, our baller, we've gone for Mark Gahey. Um, as I said, one of the, the top passers in the league. Uh, he averages 63 in the Premier League this season, but we're only expecting 40 or more from him. That's all we need this weekend. Uh, our playmaker, Mason Mount, as I said, it, he's the assist king for Chelsea, takes corners. So if anyone's going to help break the deadlock, it'll be him. Uh, the first of our two snipers is Kai Havertz. We expect him to have three plus shots. He's averaging four, nearly four across his last seven games for Chelsea. Uh, so we just need three plus from him. Um, and to, to finish it off, it's Wolf Saha to have two shots as well. Uh, obviously, we're not expecting him to come out on top on that duel with Rhys James, but he doesn't need to get the shots on target, just needs to get them away. Um, and he's had at least two shots in nine of his last 11 since returning from AFCON and has six in his six goals in his last eight games again for Palace. So he is in a little bit of form. So all we need from him is two plus shots. Uh, and that actually comes out at 20 to one this weekend. Not as big as last weekend, but I think there's definitely uh, value in it. Make logical bets in that. Josh, we got the terms? Yep. Uh, this weekend, Labricks have been kind enough to offer over a thousand pounds in cash prizes again. this is You won't find that sort of uh, prize money anywhere else on the platform. So make sure you enter via our league, our league, which can be found in the YouTube description or across our social channels. Um, that's £500 to the winner, as well as free bets for anyone that finishes in the top 25% of the leaderboard. All you have to do is select your lineup. You can copy ours if you want, or you can go different. Uh, place a minimum £1 bet via our official league, um, and then you're in. 
So the winning bets will be ranked from the longest to shortest odds, while non-winning bets are ranked by a percentage of the bet that lands. So even if all five of your selections don't come in, you've still got a chance of winning. And I think that's the important thing. Don't be too disheartened if one or two don't come in. You still have a great chance to win. And if you're in the top 25% of the leaderboard, then you've got a chance to win a free bet. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a good selection. I, I wouldn't mind having a look at a keeper option. Maybe instead yeah. of Zaha, that might be what I go for. We we did look at keep we did look at keepers when we were starting, but the odds were just very small, and also we're not completely sure who will start in goal for Palace. Uh, there's been a lot of rotation there. All right, that's what we think. Uh, let us know in the, in the comments below. Uh, do you agree with our choices? Have you got any opinions on our choices? If you would go with someone else, then please put your opinion forward and we'll get it in the comments. But thank you to Raj. Thank you to Josh. Thank you to you lot, obviously, for tuning in. And please remember, if you are going to be placing a bet this weekend, make sure you're over 18 and be gamble aware if you are doing so. When the fun stops, make sure you stop as well. But cheers for tuning in and we'll see you in the next one. Laters.